right, so let's go to page 55 when we're done. So it says to match the following exponential equations to their respective graphs. So let me show you what I do, what I think is the best way to handle this, is instead of just trying to match them up and stare at them, think about what you have here and draw yourself little um, pictures of the parent function. So for instance, this is 3 to the x power, which means that is an exponential growth function. Okay, so just by looking at this, that's exponential growth. Okay, then because I have that negative 4, that means it's going to reflect in the x-axis, so it's going to end up looking like that. And then that matches b, so I would say this one would be b. Okay, so I sketched those out even for myself on, you know, it's what's on the top of my paper when I did this, um, just so that you can, because they all kind of look the same, it's easy to mix it up. So I'm going to give you a minute, I want you to do the next three. And you need to put that down, pick up your pencil, and do the next three. Yeah. You can talk about it with each other, that's all fine. Okay, so on number two, if I look at that 5 to the x, that tells me it's exponential growth. The 1 half is a vertical dilation, which means it's going to squish it down, but there's no scale on this and no actual numbers, so even if I squish it down, it still has the same basic shape, which I think would be A. You all agree with that? Yes. All right, on three, since the B part is 2 sevenths, that means it's exponential decay. The three out front is just going to stretch it up, but it's still going to have that same general shape, which is D. Right? And then this two-thirds is exponential decay, but then I have a reflection, so it's going to end up looking like this, which means that would be C. Okay. Do we agree with those? Make sense? Easy enough? All right. On the next part, we're going to change the directions just a little bit because I meant to do it before I printed it. We're going to write the limit statements for just the left end behaviors, just for the interest of time. So I still think I would like to know what these look like. So I'm going to do myself a little sketch here again. This is exponential growth. And then that 3 fifths doesn't really change the basic shape. So then I'm going to go to write my limit. Limit as x approaches what? Negative infinity. Okay, I know that it's negative infinity because it says left end behaviors. Okay, it's not the right, it's not as it approaches zero or anything else. So as f of x, so the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is what? No, zero. As x approaches negative infinity, as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, y is approaching zero. Okay, because you have an asymptote there, right? And on the subject of asymptotes, because I overheard, I don't remember if it was in a class or if it was during map time last week, but um, there, uh, I, you know, I like to make fun of Mrs. Archer when she says asymptotes. So for those of y'all that had Archer, um, but I overheard somebody that had Archer talking to somebody that didn't, and they were they said asymptote, and so whoever they were sitting with corrected them, and they're like, it's asymptote, and they were like making them say it right. And she's like, okay, I get it, I get it. And then she goes, but then what's an asymptote? And they're like, it's nothing. It's not like, she was thinking of it as two different things. It's the, it, it doesn't exist. She's just pronouncing it wrong. So I didn't even think that I needed to clarify that those are not two different things. Yes, ma'am. Let's go. How do we know that it's like Because it is a, if, well, if there, because the, it is a, um, that's a good question. So the question was, how do we know it's actually approaching zero and not like 0.1 or 1 or whatever? If this is a, an exponential graph and we have not shifted it up or down, the parent function for, an, if I just had 4 to the x, 
you always have a horizontal asymptote right here at zero. Okay, and then this doesn't affect that. The only thing that would affect that is a shift up or down, and we don't have that. That's how we know it's zero. If I just had the graph and I didn't know necessarily that it was exponential and I didn't know there wasn't a tiny bit, then I would kind of be assuming things, which is bad, but because we don't have a vertical shift here, that's why. Okay, good question. Anything else? All right. Um, okay, so then on six, I'm going to look at, I've got exponential growth, right? But then I have a reflection, so that means it ends up looking like that, but better always, but it's a sketch, gives you enough. So this is the limit. Again, it is going to be as x approaches negative infinity of g of x. And what is that limit going to be? Zero. We're still approaching zero, just approaching it from the bottom instead of from the top. Also, I've tried to make a big deal with y'all about the fact that you've got to be careful about what these are really named. Like, we can't name everything f. If it's f of x, it's f of x. If it's g of x, it's g of x. Um, uh, Saturday, when y'all were probably sleeping in or maybe hopefully doing something fun, I was on a six-hour Zoom training for AP Pre-Cal, which I asked to go to, so I'm not really complaining. But um, one of the things we did was go back over the FRQs from last year, and um, and there was one on there, which, I mean, I already knew this, and this is why I'm making a big deal with you about it, that the person had done everything beautifully on this FRQ, right? And um, except that when they had to write their limit statement, they, the thing was called G, but they said F, and then they did not get credit, okay? So it's not just about your form. You have to use the correct names. I mean, that's why I've made such a big deal about that, because I want you to get every point that you can get. Um, FRQs are six points a piece, if I haven't already said that. Um, so that's, that's just one of the six points, which is a lot. Like one point out of 100 is not that much necessarily, but one out of six, that's huge. You don't want to miss it just because you weren't paying attention to the name. So just continue to be careful with that. And if you feel like, you know what, I've messed that up before, or maybe you mess it up all the time, or maybe you never have and it's not an issue for you, that's fine too. But if you, I mean, maybe you circle and go, okay, when I do this, it's called H. i got to call it H and not call it F. And be real careful with that. All right, so then I'm going to sketch this. This is decay, so it looks like this. There's no reflection, so that's what we've got. We've got the limit as x approaches negative infinity of h of x. What is that limit going to be? Infinity. Very good. Any questions at all? All right, so the next three should be super easy, especially since we've just sort of talked about all of that. Thank you very much. And um, let's see what this is going to be. So it just says classify as exponential growth or decay. So the number out front doesn't mean anything. It's the B part that matters, right? This is greater than 1, so it's growth. So what do you think about 9? Decay. What do you think about 10? Growth, OK? So some people see a fraction and always want to say decay. It doesn't have to do with being a fraction. It has to, be, has to do with B being greater than or less than 1. Okay? Everybody good with that? Easy enough? All right. Flip it over. Oh, that's not flipped. There we go. All right. So this says to rewrite each of the following exponential functions in the equivalent general form. So it's giving us a specific form that we want. There's lots of different ways we could write them, but I'm trying to get, in a, get it into general form, which means my exponent cannot have addition and subtraction in it. So we're going to rewrite it. I can rewrite this as 4 to the x times 4 squared, right? Because if I multiply two things with the same base, I add the exponents. So if the exponents are being added, then I can break it back apart into multiplication. Then this is f of x. I do 4 squared, which is 16, and it's 16 times 4 to the x power. Okay, bless you. And there was some question last week on whether or not the x had to be outside the parentheses or not, and yes, it does, because what's in parentheses here is b. b is not 4 to the x. b is 4. Does that make sense? So then the exponent is outside there. <coughs> okay. And then 2, so I um, can change this to... 6 to the x times 6 to the negative 2 power. Okay, 6 squared is 36, but since it's negative, it's going to be 1 over 36 times 6 to the x power. 
Any questions about that? Awesome. Then you do number three. Okay, so 8 to the negative 1 power is 1 over 8, right? So if I multiply 5 times 1 over 8, I get 5 over 8 times 8 to the x power. Any questions? We good? All right, so let's look at, so these all had addition or subtraction in the exponents. These three have multiplication or division. So I can change this because I just need a times b to the x. I can only have just an x in the exponent. I can rewrite this as 9 squared to the x power. So now b, instead of being 9 like it was in the original, now it's 9 squared, which is 81. Okay. And it's okay to write them without the parentheses. I mean, that's how you're going to see it sometimes. But I do think it is a good habit to be in, to be writing that, because if it was a fraction and you left it off, that would be bad. And when it's typed out, it's, it's a lot more obvious where everything goes and how it's related. When it's handwritten, sometimes it's a little more difficult to decipher for yourself sometimes or for the person grading it. So it's just kind of a safe thing to do. All right, so then on 5, I could make this 16 to the 1 half power to the x power. What is 16 to the 1 half power? 4. So this is just 4 to the x power. Okay. Everybody good? All right. Then you, question? Then you do number 6. I got 3 times 16 to the x power. Y'all agree with that? Okay, so if we look back up at these 6 that we just did, notice that if you have um, addition or subtraction in the exponent, then the number out in front changes. So this was 5, and then now it's 5 eighths. This didn't have a number out front, and now I have one. This didn't have one, and now I have one, right? So it, it's changing your a. If you have multiplication or division, the A doesn't change. There's nothing in front. There's nothing in front. Nothing in front. Or 3 was here. 3 is still here. Instead, it's changing the B value. So the addition and subtraction changes the A value. The multiplication and division, division changes the B value. Right? And even if you don't make that connection, as long as you don't make up math when you're doing things, you'll be fine. All right, so let's look at number 7. It says, which of the following functions is an equivalent form? All right, so above, it told, we knew exactly we wanted general form. Y equals A times B to the X. Equivalent form, it's not necessarily general form. And, but, so there's a lot of different things that I could do here. One of the things I could do on what they gave me is I could change the 4 to a 2 squared and do something that way. But I don't think I want to do that because when I look at my answer choices, my bases are all either 16 or 48. And so it kind of gives me an idea of where I want to go with that. So instead, I can make this into 3 times 4 squared to the x power. So that gives me 3 times 16 to the x power, which is b, okay. which is general form. But again, they're not all necessarily always in general form. We good on that? All right, I'm going to give you a couple minutes. I want you to do the next two.
when you're done, you can check yourself with me, see if we agree. Hopefully we do. C and A there, all right? Are there any questions on any of that? And these three did end up being in general form, but um, in our notes and stuff, they, they weren't all necessarily in general form when it is a multiple choice. You might have to do other things, all right? Questions, anything? All righty, then grab your notes that I just put out there. These are going on page 56 when we're done. Okay, so today we're gonna do, we're gonna do data modeling, which means we're gonna write equations from data. Um, today we're gonna do the non-calculator stuff. Tomorrow is gonna be the calculator part of that. So this says sometimes, sometimes, but not always, data from an exponential function does not display a proportional growth pattern. Okay, so what that means is like if we look at A, that data, it does not display a proportional growth pattern. Meaning if I put 13 over 7 and 25 over 13, those are not the same numbers, right? So and then it says this is due to a vertical translation of the function. Okay, that means there's a plus something because we have plus or minus because we translated it vertically. So then, however, if we can add or subtract a constant from the output values to reveal, to reveal the proportional growth pattern, then we can write the equation, okay? And the equation means then that we take general form, which is y equals a times b to the x, but then we have a plus k, k being that constant for my vertical shift either up or down. So this says, selected values from several exponential functions are given in the tables below. For each, we're going to find the constant value that can be added or subtracted to the output values to reveal proportional growth patterns, then write the equation. So there are lots of different ways to do this. The, I think the easiest way to do it is just be consistent in what we've been doing with this stuff from the beginning, is that I look at the x's, all right? So I have equal length input value intervals. These are specifically one, which always makes things even better. And like I said before, if I put 13 over seven and 25 over 13, clearly I don't see a proportional, um, a proportional pattern there. But if I take, and I start looking at my differences. 13 minus 7 is 6. 25 minus 13 is 12. 49 minus 25 is 24. And 97 minus 49 is 48. So just by doing that, now do you see a proportional growth pattern? Yes? So that means that's your B part, right? This is the R when we were looking at geometric patterns. But that growth rate then is our B, and we get that by doing 12 over 6 or 24 over 12, and that is 2, because we're doubling it every time. Okay. So then we have to figure out what K is. Again, there's a few different ways to do that, but um, one of the things that you are asked to do on one of your FRQs, this, this is what it says specifically. Use the given data to write two equations that can be used to find the values for the constants A and B. Well, this is a little bit different because we already found A, a and B. Or, I'm sorry, we already found B. But I need to find A and K. So the first thing we're going to do is write two equations that can be used to find A and K. And I will stress this many times as we go over these FRQs, but um, that's literally all that the first part says, okay? The little, I don't know, lowercase Roman numeral I. Write the two equations, period, end of story, and stop. That is worth one of your six points. I cannot tell you how many people that I could not get it across to them. They would write them and then try and do all this stuff. Nobody said to do anything with it. The directions literally said, write the equations, Oop, and then that's what you do. Okay, so we're going to operate on that first, like we're just going to write the equations. So what, what we can do um, for, is we have this, just like anything you ever do with equations, we are going to substitute in everything we know and not and just look for the stuff that we don't know. So in order to do that and use that, I have B, I have X's and Y's right here, so I'm gonna pick two ordered pairs. It does not matter which ones. 
I would say don't make your life more difficult for no reason. Just use the ones with the smallest numbers, right? Just use the first two that you have. There's no reason not to do that. So then if I'm going to set up an equation using this first ordered pair, which is an xy ordered pair, I can substitute in the y. That is 7. That is equal to a that we don't know times b, which is 2, to the x power x is 0 plus k. So I have filled in b and x and y because those are things that I know. Then I do it again for the next one. y is 13. That's equal to a, which I don't know, times b, which is 2, to the x power, which is 1, plus k. That right there or something very similar to it will get you one point on that FRQ. And it does. nobody's even asked you to do any math. You're just substituting stuff in. Does that make sense? We good? And then the second part would say, find the values of A and B, or in this case, the A and K, and we're going to write the equation. So um, when I, actually, even starting here, the rest of what we do in this question, just everybody listen to me very carefully, has absolutely nothing to do with pre-cal. It is 1,000% algebra. So if you don't have a clue what I'm doing, I don't know what to tell you. you got to know your algebra, all right? So we are going to... I'm going to clean this up a little bit, meaning two, what is 2 to the 0 power? 1. 7 equals a plus k, and then we get 13 equals 2 to the first is just 2, 2a plus k. Okay, so we just clean them up a little bit. But there's no reason to, if it just says write the equations, you don't have to clean up anything, so don't, right? Because if we made a mistake there, then we wouldn't get those point, that point for the, for the writing the equations. All right, so then um, I've got two equations and two variables. That is a system of equations. So I'm going to take this one and solve it for k. 13 minus 2a equals k. So this is equal to k, and there's a k right here. So I'm going to do substitution. Take this and substitute it in right there. So that's going to give me 7 equals a plus 13 minus 2a. So that'll give me negative 6 equals negative a, so a equals 6. Okay, there's the first part of what I need. And then since I have that, I can find k. I'm going to use this right here and say that 7 is equal to 6 plus k, which means that k equals 1. So now I have a and k. I had already figured out b, so I write my equation. This is f of x. That is equal to a, which is 6, times b, which is 2, to the x power plus k, which is 1. That's my equation. Okay. What questions do you have? Anything? All right. Let's move on to B then. So I look again. These are, you know, got um, equal length input value intervals. 10 over 2 is not the same as 13 over um, as 34 over 10. So I'm going to do my differences here. This is 8. This is 24. This is 72. This is 216. So what is B? 3. B is equal to 3. All right, so we're going to write two equations that can be used to find A and K. I'm going to use these ordered pairs of 0, 2, and 1, 10. Okay, see if you can write two equations and stop. There are my two equations. Do we agree with that? Just substitute and then, then we stop, right? So if I'm asked just to write them, I wrote them. Nobody says you have to clean them up or do anything. Just boom, there they are. We can get a point. 
And then we're going to move on and clean them up a little bit. So this will give me 2 equals a plus k and 10 equals 3a plus k. So then again, I have two equations and two variables, so I have a system, which means this is going to be 10 minus 3a equals k. This is k, this is k, so I'm going to substitute this in here and get 2 equals a plus 10 minus 3a. So I get negative 8 equals negative 2a, so a equals 4. <clears throat> Everybody with me? Then I got to find k, so I'm going to use this again <clears throat> and get 2 equals 4 plus k. So k equals a negative 2. All right. Now I have a and k and b, which I have from the beginning there. This function's name is g of x, so that is equal to a, which is 4, times b, which is 3, to the x power, minus 2. What questions do you have? Anything? All right. Then on C, go ahead and find your differences and figure out what B is. What is B? Not negative, just one half. Because if I do negative 16 over negative 32, it is just one half. Okay. So B is one half. Now I need two ordered pairs. 0, 63 will work. And 1, 31. Right? Write your two equations and stop. Then, once you have them written, check them with me. If we agree, then you go on and do the rest.
So don't just copy mine down. When you're done, tuck it up here. Be very careful not to skip steps and do things like that because that's where our silly mistakes happen, right? So much so like if you get here and you get that this is 64 and you're like, oh look, this is 64, 63. So that's just one away. It'd be really easy for you to just to say K is equal to one, right? If you're just zipping through it, not paying attention. So even when it's simple, it's very helpful just to write it down because it doesn't take you that much longer and it sometimes saves you from some sort of careless error. All right, any questions at all? Awesome.